Hello, everybody. It's nice to see everyone. Sorry I took so long again. It's like every week there's something new that's keeping me from getting on here at 5 p.m. I tried to get on earlier to get everything ready, and it still didn't matter. I still was not able to get everything set up in time. It was five minutes after five, and I still was not able to get my Facebook uh, set up properly. And I don't know why. Usually there's a block right there that says go live. You click it, and it goes. But for some reason, I was not able to access that block at all today. Um, so, so I'm finally here. I'm finally on. Um, let's see. I got the comment section on Facebook open, so you can put comments in there. I also have the comment section on YouTube open if you happen to be at my YouTube stream. All right. Now, um, and in case any of you don't know me, my name is Venus Brown. I am a mother of two, wife of Craig Brown. Um, my children are, uh, one is a teenager and the other is a young adult. So, um, so they're not little kids. They are, they're, they're young adult kids. Um, uh, youngest one is Taylin Brown. Um, and I use a, a lot of times I'll refer to them as my youngest and my oldest. So my youngest is Taylin Brown. My oldest is Benjamin Barrett, who legally got his name changed. So, um, and again, my husband is Craig Brown. I have a master's degree in applied sociology from UCF, a bachelor's degree in. Uh, liberal studies with focus on social science and the arts and a minor in early childhood education. I worked for quite a while in early childhood education. I worked for a little while at, as a substance abuse counselor and case manager. Um, this Facebook uh, display is quite disruptive because it keeps putting up notifications on top of everything. So, so hopefully I can uh, ignore that. I'll just uh, look at the YouTube thing and every once in a while I'll check the comments section to make sure that there is no comments coming on that I am missing. All right. Um, and today what I wanted to talk about is the, uh, the seeming uptick in attacks on, um, on basic human rights. And this is occurring here in America, in various states, but also um, federally, nationwide. And it's also occurring in other countries. Um, so, and the general pushes of these problems seem to be coming from similar groups. So, so, um, so let's talk about that. All right. Um, I have a list of kind of cues right here, which I will go through. Last time I did a live stream, I did have an issue where I kept kind of jumping the gun and just speaking on everything that I wanted to talk about without really going by my cues. And then when I um, went and paid attention to my cue cards, I had already gone over several things and ended up talking about the same thing over and over again. So I'm going to try not to do that. Uh, let me take a little bit to take a drink of coffee here. And I know it's about after five o'clock and I'm drinking coffee. That's okay. This is something I do. I like to have coffee twice a day, usually once in the morning and once in the late afternoon. Today, it's been a little bit later because I have been, I have been looking at Facebook and watching the um, January 6th hearings most of the day. And it's been... Uh, it's been kind of heart wrenching, and uh, but it's also kept me preoccupied with that. So, so I didn't get up until right before this to get my coffee. Um, so, um, I, I decided also to go ahead and take a look online to see, like, 
what um, what articles that are, that are being posted and what evidence there is concerning what I have been noticing. And I think a lot of people have been noticing that there seems to be this increase on on attacks on our basic rights. And it's not just it's not just groups pushing a a narrative and um, trying to get their way. It's like it's like these groups are actually succeeding in getting legislation passed, in getting um, getting the courts to actually take their side on this. And so that was one of the things that I was looking at. Um, there's been multiple attacks on free speech and free press. Um, I think after I'm done here, I will put a couple of links. I have a link on um, on some of the free, spe- free speech and free press attacks that we've been seeing lately. So I'll place that in there after I am done with the live stream in my uh in my descriptions in both YouTube and Facebook. Um, I also found an article about the, the, um, the reality for international rights. So, so even internationally, um, one of the things that, uh, that I, that I saw in, uh, one of the articles, I think it was actually in two of the articles, they talked about how they, um, they, rate countries each year on um, like how how they're doing with human rights and whether they're going up in human rights or going down in human rights. And they said like in more for more than a decade, they have been pers- like uh, gradually uh, going down like more and more countries with their human rights actually going down every year in the last decade in more than a decade. And I don't know about for you, but for me, that's got to be frightening. This isn't just in um, underdeveloped areas. This is all over the world. This is in places that we consider first world nations, that we consider free, like America. We consider America free. But I mean, I've always told my kids that that uh, that we are considered free, but it has all these restrictions and caveats that we're not really free. We are free to speak against the government, but only in certain situations and only with certain stipulations. We are we are free to do all these things without getting put in jail. But if we break those regulations, we can easily be put in jail. And even if we don't break those regulations, if somebody accuses us of breaking those regulations, we can be put in jail. So so while we like to say we're free, it's not completely free, but it does feel like in the last few years, there has been a real attack on just so many areas. Okay. So, so I think today of all days, especially if you're here in America and you've been listening to the news or paid attention to social media at all, um, then you probably know what's happened with the Supreme Court and their decision about Roe versus Wade, which was the uh, judicial decision that, that allowed us all the freedom to choose whether to carry in a carry a pregnancy to term or get an abortion early in pregnancy and they just overturned that so it's not that we no longer have any right to abortion but now it is um it is basically that the states themselves are allowed to choose that for us they're taking that decision from us, from our doctors, our families, ourselves, our individual, they're taking away our individual autonomy, saying that we don't have the right to make that choice. The state has the right to make that choice for us. And I find that completely appalling. I find it completely ridiculous. And I understand that some people feel that that life begins at conception that um, that these are lives that we're terminating, but 
in my opinion, that is your privilege to have that view and to make that choice for yourself. But you should not force your views and your perspectives on everybody else. Your views and your perspectives are yours and yours alone. They belong to you. You can talk about them. You can freely express them. You can try to go and make change, but you should not be forcing other people to have your perspective or forcing your perspective on them. And that's what this does. That is what this ultimately does. And while you may believe that um, that human life begins at conception, I believe that all life begins as soon as there is any life at all, cells, amoebas, bacteria, viruses, and I would not be stopping somebody from terminating a virus or a bacteria. And I know it's not the same thing, but I still wouldn't do it. I still wouldn't be asking anybody to do it. It is not my decision. That is is their decision. Okay. So, So for me personally, yes, I understand that's life, but that is not a human life. To me, a human life is somebody that is viable. Like that is, that is, which is why I'm okay with saying that, okay, once a pregnancy gets to a point where, uh, where the unborn child would actually be able to live on its own outside of the mother, um, I'm okay with saying that at that point, then it's no longer just the parent's decision. Then it, then there near there need to be other factors involved, but to say that from conception, from the moment that you hear a heartbeat, from the moment that there is a functioning brain, to me that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that there's viability. That doesn't mean that that um, that that if that fetus were born, that it would be able to live on its own outside of the mother's womb. You are utilizing that mother that woman or man or whoever is holding that that um pregnancy you're you're using their body in order to maintain this pregnancy and they should have the right to choose whether their body is used in that way um and i know i shouldn't stay on this topic too long it's just it's very present right now because of what's going on. It's always present, but it's it's really disturbing in my opinion. Um, so yeah, reproductive rights, and it's not just abortion. They've been going after our reproductive rights of of birth control, contraception, of of um, our ability to have children or not have children, um, our ability to. Uh, to, to have surgeries, all of that, like they've been going after that all along, requiring us to get permission from, from our husbands or requiring us to get permission from parents and things like that, requiring us to wait until a certain age to decide that, that that's okay to make that kind of decision. Um, that stuff has been going on all along, but um, I think there's also been a lot of chipping away at um, things like contraception. Contrace- uh, contraception that's been going on for ever since Roe has passed. It's been going on, and it feels like um, it was slowed down a little bit, uh, at least in America, after um, after our insurance policy was passed that said that that the insurance companies had to cover contraception. But if you actually look into it, there are still states that put in prohibitions on certain contraception, that put in um, requirements for you to tell certain people, that put in um, prohibitions on certain things that are covered versus certain things that are not, or who is willing, who who is able to say that you cannot do something, that, that this is prohibited if a certain person says not to. That stuff still is occurring in states. Um, there was um, some stuff that was protected by the Supreme Court. I imagine that 
may go out the window after this, but I don't know for sure. But um, even with those protections that the Supreme Court did uphold, there were still other things that they said that states could still prohibit when it comes to contraception, when it comes to abortion, when it comes to all sorts of things. So, so this isn't just about abortion, but right now it feels very heavily on abortion, which is disturbing to me. Um, uh, okay, so another area that has been, that I've been seeing a lot, a lot, especially in the last year or two, book bans. Banning books, um, sometimes in school, sometimes for children, but sometimes just banning books outright, trying to ban them outright because I, I'll go over some of the reasoning later, but um, right now I'm mostly trying to talk about what things that I'm seeing being attacked. Book bans, book bans on LGBTQ plus communities on their issues, book bans on um, racial topics, on um, people of color, African Americans, on uh, on all sorts of things. Anything that anybody sees as sexual or sexualized, and um, education bans. We're seeing a lot of the same book bans being applied to education bans. And um, and I live in Florida. It's been particularly bad here. The education bans that they've applied. Um, so the most recent one, I think, that was in the news uh, was being called the no Don't Say Gay Bill. Okay. Um, because this directly attacks any education about LGBTQ plus people, any of it. Um, and it's for, um, I think it's like third grade and below, but, but that's why it was called that. And then there was another one that I heard about right before that, which was um, concerning critical race theory. Now, mind you, critical race theory is not taught in grade school. Critical race theory is something, uh, it's kind of this idea that, um, that our judicial system, our, our whole system was created, that was created with kind of white supremacist ideas and, um, and it was created for white people by white people, and um, and the the education, the judicial system, the the entire system that we live in, our society, was all kind of built on these ideas, built on on creating this system that props up the mainstream, but sometimes at the expense of minorities. Okay, and so the idea is that the the idea for critical race theory was actually um, uh, it was actually created in the in the schools for people learning to be lawyers, uh, you know, in the justice system. That that because this system exists, because it was created the way it was, um, there are certain judicial laws, there are certain procedures, there all of that that are in place within the judicial system that create these um, uh, these positions of inequality within the judicial system and within the rest of the system because we all have to fall under that judicial system okay and that is that is taught mainly in colleges and mainly in, legal degrees, not in regular everyday degrees, not in regular everyday classes, and not in grade school at all. But um, what was actually what was actually passed in Florida is worse. It is so much worse. So so they're not actually attacking critical race theory. They're attacking 
anything that covers the history of race in our country, African Americans, the the reality of what they've been through, people in history that actually have done something that are people of color, like they're attacking all of it, all of it. And they put in this caveat in, in this policy that they passed that basically says that if the this um, historical topic causes shame or guilt among white people, then it shouldn't be taught at all. We can have stuff in our education system that causes shame and guilt and, and all of that for any other minority group, but we're going to specifically target this because it might cause some shame and guilt in white people. And that's just disturbing to me, but, um, really, I don't, I don't even know. It's just, it's been set up so that basically they can attack almost any kind of, uh, racial history topic that they want and say that this cannot be covered. You know, and that's that's disturbing. But not only that, within these two policies, I'm not sure which one they used, but within them, the education department has basically said, oh, we're also not going, we're going to prohibit lessons on emotional development. Emotional development. I, I don't know how much understanding you have of what emotional development lessons are, okay? A lot of these are used specifically, um, I mean, they're partially used to help uh, teach kids empathy and to teach kids, um, you know, proper, you know, kind of your, how to have constraint on your emotions, how to deal with your emotions, that kind of stuff that, that having these emotions is normal, that kind of thing. But primarily emotional development were lessons that were created for kids that have that have disabilities like like um neurological disabilities emotional development um uh, um what was it called kids that are developmentally disabled and some of these lessons are specifically made for these kids cuz there's they, because because they because it helps them to get along in in society. I, I mean, I, I just, I cannot understand under any circumstances what it was that they were claiming to be against that made them decide that we're going to attack emotional development, say that could not be taught in schools. I, I find that absurd. Um, let's see what else overturning free and fair elections. Now I know some of you are probably Trump supporters and you feel that, and you may feel that the election was inaccurately taken from you, that you feel that there's fraud maybe that had gone on, but there have been numerous numerous fact-finding missions showing that there was no indication of the kind of fraud that that was being um was being told to that side and and we have it, it's been taken to court numerous courts over and over again we've gone through we've gone through proving that that all of these things that um, that were we were being told was fraudulent were not actually happening, and we've gone over the numbers numerous times. There is no evidence whatsoever that Donald Trump won the election. Yet we still have people that insist that he did. We have people that are watching the hearings now and saying that they're completely false and and. 
I find it disturbing, but it, it's not just, just like the other things, it's not just affecting the narrative. It's not just affecting people's opinions within society. Like there are people intentionally trying to overturn free, fair elections that have occurred all over this country. Not just Trump's. But many other elections, they are intentionally trying to get these things overturned based on voter fraud that has not been shown to actually exist. So what can you do? What can you do? I don't know. I don't know. But something needs to be done because you can't just... I understand you're frustrated, you're upset, and you want things to go a certain way, and and the people that you've been listening to have been telling you that there's this fraud, but at some point you have to pay attention to the facts. You have to pay attention to reality, trying to overturn other people's votes, trying to trying to overturn an election that was free and fair, that the voters decided and saying that their votes don't count, we're going to automatically turn over this election. We're going to say, oh, the vice president has the right to overturn this election and decide it how he wants to. Oh, the governor has the right to overturn this um, state election and decide it how he wants to. That's not how it works. That has never been how it works. So... And, and I am glad that at least in that situation, I have not seen, um, I have not seen these, um, efforts to actually work, but they are sure pushing hard. They really have been pushing hard. They have been trying everything they can to, 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 to get their way. And it's disturbing. Um, Okay, here's another thing. I see this a little bit here and there, but I am not um I'm not directly connected to um to these groups. I don't know a lot about it and I, um but I do hear every now and then about certain uh religious regalia, clothing items, cultural items and stuff like that being prohibited in certain areas by certain groups in certain situations. Um, and, and I find that very disturbing. I, I am not an explicitly religious person myself. I have been in the past. I am not anymore, but I still believe that every person should have the right to their own religion and their own belief system. And if their religion has certain uh, certain clothing items and certain cultural items that are part of that religion that should be respected. Um, I don't think religious people should be able to, um, I don't think they should be able to interfere with other people's civil rights because of their religious views. But I believe that they should be able to practice their re religion. They should be able to wear whatever it is is um, is expected in their religion if that is what they choose. They should be able to choose their religion, their religious practices, all of that. They just should not be able to interfere with the rights of other people at all. Um, okay. And another main thing I'm seeing a lot of attacks on gender identity, on various minority groups, various identities, um, throughout the LGBTQ plus community, but in other minority communities as well, like a lot of attacks on identity, on minority groups. And which brings me to my, um, the, the last area that I'm seeing on it is, is attacks on exceptional needs on, on people with disabilities, people who, who have, um, disorders, like so many attacks on, on, on those minorities as well. Um, 
I don't know about you, but mm, I don't know. I feel like I was raised that you're supposed to treat people with kindness and courtesy and respect. And a person with special needs should be like off limits for, for attacking. And, and yet they're being like directly attacked. Having certain healthcare options taken from them, having their autonomy taken from them, having being told that they can't like that, certain educational methods that are specifically for them are not allowed to be used anymore. That is insane. That is insane. But those are the kinds of attacks that are occurring. And um, and in some ways, that's worse in other countries. In many ways, it's worse in other countries. But I, I'm mostly talking about here in America. But I definitely did notice that there's a lot of stuff that goes on in other countries where they're using these same methods. They're using these same methods from same types of people, same groups of people to, um, to prohibit things in other countries, in all of these areas. And to intentionally attack people from every minority group that you can think of. It's disturbing. All right. Okay. So I'm going to ask a question. Let me see. I'm going to write it in here. Last time I copied and pasted, but I'm going to have to write it because I'm out of time. Okay. So what attacks have you observed? So if you've observed any attacks, um, put in what attacks that you've observed recently in like the last four or five years. Um, and who do you think would do this? Okay. So let me, ah, there we go. All right. Enter. All right. So what attacks have you observed recently in like the last few years or maybe even the last decade if you want to go back that far and who would do this? All right. And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about now. The who, at least from what I'm seeing in uh, news articles and research from colleges, from, from, uh, from, organizations that actually keep track of this. So so one of the main one of the main groups that we're seeing a lot of these attacks from are populist authoritarians. Okay. Um, this is happening all over the world. In <laughs> all over the world. All over the world. So um I don't know, maybe really look into what a populist authoritarian is who they are, how they operate, how they think, what kind of um what kind of changes they've made because in countries all over the world they have been using this populist authoritarian um ideas to um to really I think to capitalize on nationalism, on individualism, individual nationalism um on states' rights and and on interfering with um, basic human rights, um, but there's also been like intentional uh, attacks on uh, democratic, um, like democratically elected um, politicians on um, positions that traditionally were elected positions where where somebody came in, changed things up, and actually said, nope, nope, I'm going to appoint everybody in this position. So things that, and I'm not saying this occurs in America, but there are other countries where they did have a democratic system and a populist authoritarian came in and intentionally changed the system, intentionally started taking um, taking positions that were democratically elected positions and and scraped scrapped that, scrapped that and started putting in their own, appointing their own people. 
and um, started <laughs> gradually attacking the Supreme Court or a- attacking their court system, starting um, weakening their court system or putting in you know, putting in the kind of people they want. And if you look at some of the stuff that's going on in America, there are so many parallels that are occurring with specific types of people being put into to positions with certain types of people being put into the judicial system with, uh, with weakening of basic, uh, voter rights and public rights while strengthening the rights of the states and the governments. I I think you should really take a look at that. Okay. um, uh, Other areas, this, these two groups have always been a problem. Um, They're usually who we always talk about extremists on the left and the right, conservative and liberal extremists. Um, I think we've always kind of uh, pointed our ire at them when stuff happens or when things are pushed. Um, But I think today it feels like um, they're still a problem, but we're seeing a lot of the extremist conservatives really get in their way, like really getting legislation changed, really getting, um, really getting the courts changed, really getting like all these higher up upper level positions changed in a way that is permanently changing our rights, making it illegal for us to do things that should have been considered our basic rights all along. Um, and extremists on the left are still there. They're still doing their thing. But it seems like a lot of what I'm seeing on the left is them working on the narrative, working on framing, working on opinions and the way society feels about things. But they do not seem to be at all successful at getting changes, uh, at least not in the last few years. For a little while, they were getting really good changes, I think, put in that were actually helping human rights, that were actually providing basic rights that should have already existed, should have always existed. Um, uh, But lately, it seems like they've just been had very little, um, very little success in. pushing their ideas. And yes, some liberal ideas are stupid and dangerous. We have seen some of the stuff that's been put in in the past, decades past, that were put in by liberals that um, that have caused major problems for minorities. Because, <laughs> because unfortunately, everybody thinks they know what the right thing to do is with a certain group of people. Everybody thinks they know. And liberals are no different in this aspect. Conservatives think they know the right thing to do, and liberals think they know the right thing to do. And sometimes you make decisions for other people that are bad, and liberals have done it too. Um, I'll just say that if you think that you are going to fix some thing for someone, if you think you're going to put in a policy that you think is going to help somebody or fix something for someone, you really should make sure that those someones are in your decision-making rooms, that they are in the room with you, that they have an actual voice in what's being said, and that there are many of them. Because one person in a minority does not make choices for everybody else. They are they are not the voice for everybody in that minority. But if you're not talking to anybody in that group and you're saying, oh, well, if we do this, it's going to fix this and that and the other thing, but you're not asking them, you're not, you're not going to them, you're not finding out like what their experience is, how they have been dealing with things, what things are actually a problem, and what things that um, might be able to put in place that might work or what things that have already been put in place that have actually already worked. If you're not going to them to find any of that stuff out 
and you're just saying, oh yeah, I know what to do. I'm going to fix it. You're, you're going to, you're going to badly mess things up. And that's what, that's what has happened in the past. So, so uh, leftists are not um, free of blame here for things going badly, but it does feel like lately they have not been successful in getting things done. Um, I do see, at least when I was going to school and college, that there is a lot more focus on actually collaborating with, um, with minority groups actually keeping minority groups as part of the discussion and keeping them as actual respected people that are making major decisions um, for them. So I think that's at least a step in the right direction. It needs to keep on going that way. But it does feel like um, on the liberal side, I have not seen a lot of success on uh, not from moderate or extreme liberals, but on the side of extremist conservatives. I'm seeing a lot implemented on the extreme conservative side, not the moderate conservative side. And I'm seeing it really implemented in laws, in laws here in America and in other countries and in various states across the country. When they're not able to get it passed federally, they definitely uh, work hard to work on state and local systems. Okay. Um, religious and non-religious groups. Okay. So there's a, um, one of the things that was addressed in some of the international articles was that there are a lot of, um, a lot of groups that are using religion as an excuse to make inhumane decisions, to make inhumane policies. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit, but it's not just religious groups. There's there's other stuff I'll, I'll talk about. It. It's like some of the main pushes to enforce, to, to implement these changes in law and some of the main pushes to um, enforce these changes in law um, are are occurring from, like I said, populi- populist authoritarians, certain really extreme conservative and religious groups, um, uh, also from authoritarian dictators, but authoritarian dictators always existed. They've always existed. They've always been causing problems, but... Um, but they continue to cause problems and they continue and they, and they also have been working with these other groups to, to make problems worse. Um, White supremacist groups. We, I think at one point, maybe we wanted to think that they were gone or that they weren't a problem anymore. We, at least as a humanity in America, I think got to a point where we felt like white supremacy was unacceptable and that people, exhibiting white supremacist ideas and language and attitudes and behaviors were unacceptable. And it seems like lately, they don't care. They don't care. We can tell them all day until we're blue in the face that what they're doing, how they're behaving, what they're thinking is unacceptable. They're like, um, we've been given the power and the authority to say whatever we want and do whatever we want. We have a right to act like this and to be like this. And so we're going to do it. Whereas at one time it felt like they at least kind of weren't so brazen and open about it. Whereas now they seem to be very brazen and open. But uh, anyway, um, so what I was going to talk about when I was talking about the religious, non-religious thing. Okay. So, um, what was it? Um, one of the articles said, they talked about how, uh, how these groups were, were affecting change, how they were creating these changes, how they were creating this situation. So one of the things they said was that, um, they are actually infiltrating human rights spaces as human rights activists. They're going into these spaces and claiming to be human rights activists. 
They are learning the language of human rights issues and learning how those issues are fought. And then they are taking that, manipulating it for themselves to enforce their own ideas, their own non-humane rights ideas to put this stuff into effect. You like using human rights language, using human rights spaces to overhaul this stuff and change it. And, and um, I mean, to me that it reminds me of situations where you have um, uh, domestic violence abusers infiltrating domestic violence support groups and shelters and stuff like that. And then using what they learn to project further abuse onto their victims. Like, that's what it reminds me of. They're like, okay, look, we have infiltrated these groups that should be safe, that should be a safe space for these people. Um, these groups that are supposed to be to help human rights. And we're using everything that we're learning to turn it around on them and, and make things worse for them. Take their rights away from them. And, and using pseudoscience in order to back it up. Okay. So I'm seeing a lot of this. I am seeing so much, uh, so much, both um, politically and in the courts. Okay. So, so in the courts, using pseudoscience as a way to back up their claims and getting doctors that will, doctors and scientists that will agree with the pseudo, pseudoscience to back up their claims um, against one thing or another. All right, let's see here. Now, so some of the things they use to justify this, I think we already talked, I already talked a little bit about um, the whole uh, abortion thing. You know, some people feel that, uh, that you're talking, they, they feel that you're talking about a living baby. Okay. You're talking about a baby. You're taking, talking about taking the life of a baby and, um, and that's how they justify the whole thing. You are taking the life of a baby and, and I do sort of get where they're coming from, but not all of us feel that the life of a baby uh, starts at conception. Many of us do not feel that um, that we, we just don't feel that way. Um, I am perfectly okay with allowing um, people to choose in their first semester to to have an abortion if that's what they choose, but I think it should really be about them. They should have their own autonomy to decide what they are going to do with their body, how they are going to use their body in that pregnancy, if they are going to continue with that pregnancy or end that pregnancy. Now, if they're intentionally um, doing things they know will harm, harm the pregnancy, without killing it that that's problematic definitely but should they be allowed to choose to have an abortion in the first semester absolutely that should be their choice keeping it should be their choice whatever it is that they decide whether to keep it or to have an abortion or to adopt it that should be their choice and should they discuss it with the other person involved in the pregnancy, maybe, but when it comes down to it, it is their body. It is them that has to, that has to, if they, if they stay pregnant, they have to develop this baby in their body for nine months and deal with all of the health, all of the health changes that occur because of it deal with all the reality of taking care of a pregnancy because of it whether they whether they put it up for an adoption or not all of that has to be 
part of that. If they're forced to have a pregnancy or if they choose to have a pregnancy, that's their body that is that is holding that pregnancy together. They should they should be able to choose that on their own. Um, and I also feel like, you know, you have to use that viability option in your judgment. If, if it's viable, then if it is viable outside of the womb, then, then, then there should be certain rights provided that unborn child. But if it is not viable outside of the womb, then no, I really feel like that should be up to the mother. And that includes um, if they have some kind of disorder or, or some kind of anomaly that is that makes it very likely that that unborn child would not be able to live, wouldn't be able to live outside the womb, then it should still be the, it should still be that person's decision. Um, let's see, anger over political correctness and woke focus. Now I see a lot of this, a lot of this, and both from liberals and conservatives, but especially from conservatives, um, just really, really angry and frustrated, feeling like they have to walk on eggshells because of this expectation to be politically correct and this focus on making, um, uh, on being woke. Okay. Um, and there are problems in that, but to me, to me, political correctness is having the intention and foresight to be conscientious and um, respectful uh, in what you're saying and doing when it comes to other people. Like think about the think about the consequences of what you're saying or doing and how they are going to affect or influence other people. And if what you are saying or doing, if you look back at that and somebody else did that to you or somebody else did that to somebody like you or, or something like that, and it might cause offense, then you shouldn't do it. Um, and that's kind of how I see political correctness is is it's just this idea that you shouldn't be intentionally trying to cause offense but even if you accidentally cause offense and somebody says hey what you said was offensive it was rude it was disrespectful or it hurt me or whatever um then have the respect and courtesy to apologize to look back at what you did Hopefully now, but also later, look back at what you did and try to understand why it was offensive and stop doing it. Stop doing it. Don't do it anymore. Like to me, that should be common courtesy and respect. But but some people see that as problematic. So and and I agree when you go too far, it becomes kind of prob problematic, but just like getting after people, telling them they're weak or they're soft or whatever, because they're saying that you should have some courtesy or you should be respectful or you shouldn't be offensive or you shouldn't do these offensive things. I think that's ridiculous. Um, that's my husband. Got to answer it. I'm going to cut this off because we are already an hour in. So, um, Next week, we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking about my diet and I'm going to be making a uh, fish piccata. So I'll see you then if you want.